John of the Eye Patch, Chapter 29, Blackbeard's Tower. John climbed aboard the Dragon of Plunder, and he took off the eye patch in the small berth that he shared with his mom, returning home where he collapsed on his bed from exhaustion. Promptly, he heard a knock on his door. Come in, he said. Everything okay in here? His dad peeked his head in. I thought for sure I heard a bird in here. I was just watching videos of parrots for my essay, Dad, John said. Amazing. It sounded just like the real thing, his dad said. Yeah, those laptop speakers are pretty good, said John. Since it's our last night in town, John, I don't really feel like cooking and cleaning before going to bed early. Boys' night out? We can go to that sushi place downtown. John realized he wouldn't have access to the eye patch if they went out to eat. Maybe after they got back, when his dad went to bed early, he'd be able to sneak back to the Caribbean. Sushi was as good as John remembered. He devoured a rainbow roll, carefully to dip, careful to dip each slice in soy sauce before plopping it in his mouth. Sometimes he liked to pick the raw fish off the top of the roll and eat it by itself. He loved the way that raw fish was tender and full of flavor. You're really getting an appetite, John, his dad commented. I'm sure I could eat ten more rolls, John said, and his dad laughed. Maybe we split one and see how you feel after that. But you keep eating like this and you'll be as tall as me in no time. I'm going to be way taller than you, John said, plopping his last crab-filled piece of sushi in his mouth. Back at home, his dad told him to get to bed so that they could have an early start in the morning. John went through the motions of laying down for bed, expecting to wait until his dad's light went off and slipped back into the Caribbean so he could check on the dragon of plunder. But the day's exercise had worn him out more than he expected, and as soon as he closed his eyes, he fell into a deep sleep, not rousing until his dad turned on John's light and told him, Time to get up, John. John looked at the clock. 4 a.m. He'd slept the whole night already. No chance to check on Mom now. John, John stumbled out of his bed. He dressed for the day and stuffed the eye patch in his pocket. He took his suitcase downstairs. His eyes felt scratchy and tired. At first, he didn't think he could eat, but when his dad put bacon and eggs in front of him, John ate like he'd gone a whole day without food, shoving whole strips of bacon into his mouth all at once. After breakfast, they walked four blocks to the nearby Max train station stop. Is that toothpaste on your suitcase? John's dad asked. John looked down where his dad pointed, a white smear on the suitcase. <gasps> that was the parrot droppings, John grimaced. He'd forgotten to clean his bag. At least his dad had mistaken the source, John decided. They took the orange line to the red line to Portland International Airport, commonly called PDX. While going through airport security, John dutifully emptied his pockets into the plastic bin and let it run through the x-ray scanner. He passed through the body scanner without incident, but when the tray of possessions cleared the scanner, a TSA agent pulled the basket off the conveyor. Uh, is this yours? The agent asked in a gruff voice. Yes, John said, suddenly realizing the eye patch wasn't in his pocket, but in the security bin. He stared at the bin hoping the agent would put it down so he could grab the eye patch. Is something wrong? John asked. Our chemical sniffer gave off an alert, the agent said. He took out a small wand and began dusting it over both John's titanium book and the former contents of his packet, his pockets. The eye patch, ten dollars, two sticks of gum, the white wad of paper, that was once a printout of treasure, 
and a handful of change. John glanced to his dad to see if he recognized the eye patch that John had snuck from his bedroom into his pocket. At the moment, however, his dad was kneeling, tying the laces of his shoes. I'm getting a really strange result from this eye patch, the agent said. It's shark skin, John said, hoping that would explain the problem. Well, that shouldn't make a difference, the agent said. Uh, it's been in the sea, in the ocean, John offered. Could be that. Has it been out of the country, the agent asked. Yes, said John automatically. Whoa, we're dealing with a potential biohazard. I'm going to have to confiscate. No, you can't, John blurted. He realized his mistake. He should have lied about the eye patch being out of the country. His dad always talked about vectors of disease and infections, and if the TSA agent thought the eye patch could be a biohazard, oh no, John would lose his only way to travel back and help mom. <clears throat> What's wrong? John's dad asked. Uh, this eye patch could be a biological risk, the agent said. John stared straight ahead. He couldn't bring himself to look up at his dad, knowing that it'd be a disapproving frown he would get back. His dad had been very clear about taking the eye patch, putting it in a box to throw it out, and had shown he had no desire to return it. Nonsense, John's dad said. It's a harmless eye patch. It's giving a false positive for bacterial contamination because sea salts can be high in bacterial building blocks. Trust me, I work with contagions for a living. His dad showed the agent his doctor's without borders identification card. Very well, the TS agent returned the box of things to John, who quickly grabbed the eye patch and thrust it back in his pocket. John put the rest of his things in his pockets and his titanium book back in his suitcase. He silently followed his dad to the gate. The longer they went without talking, the more guilty John felt for taking the eye patch in the first place. Dad, I, uh... John wasn't sure how he'd justify taking the eye patch from his dad's room. You know you're not allowed in my room, his dad said as a matter of fact stern voice. You were going to throw it out. It came out more whiny than John wanted. John stopped walking. His dad stopped walking too and turned, taking his glasses off so he could see John clearly in the eyes. This is a breach of trust that's making me rethink bringing you along this trip. You can trust me. The words felt hollow to John. If only you knew the half of it. John wasn't even sure he could trust himself at this point. The pirate world is making me just like mom. Ruthless. Flying from Portland to Atlanta and then to Nassau turned the day into 10 hours of agony for John. His desire to know what was happening to his mom continued to grow. How could he put on the eye patch? He was tempted to sneak off to the Caribbean from one of the airplane lavatories, but every time he tried that, the fastened seatbelt signs turned back on, and the flight crew ushered John back to his seat. <laughs> when they finally made their approach to Nassau, John eagerly looked out his window. It was nothing like the pirate island he was familiar with. Three massive cruise ships were in port. The small island to the north of Nassau was dominated by giant buildings overlooking the harbor. That looks like a castle, John exclaimed. His dad leaned and peeked out the window as well. That's Atlantis on Pirate Island. Is it a theme park? John asked. It's a luxury hotel. We won't be spending much time in places like that. Well, that's fine, John said. He didn't want to see modern buildings. He wanted to see the old pirate town. He scrunched around in his seat to get a better view. He could just see the old harbor street. Only now, instead of being lined with timber houses and sailcloth tents, it was lined with multi-stellar, multi-story colonial buildings. The urban sprawl pushed inland, covering nearly all of the small island. After landing, John's dad explained, we're spending the night in the Sioux, and then it's off to the islands, hardest hit by the hurricane in the morning. They took the bus from the airport to downtown, where they were staying. 
John wished for once that his dad would take a taxi instead of always replying on, relying on public transportation so that they could get to their hotel faster and John could find an opportunity to check in on his mom. Their hotel was an older building in the downtown district. Why don't we ever stay in modern buildings, Dad? John asked. Well, I've always been a cultural tourist, his dad said. More interesting in meeting the local people and seeing how they live. Ha, just imagine if you could meet Blackbird and the rest, John thought. While the hotel they stayed in didn't have a pool or fitness room or any of the amenities of a resort, it did have a brochure rack, and John browsed the available literature until he found one that caught his attention. Pirate History of Nassau. He flipped through it as they walked their bags to their room. Among the listed sites was Blackbeard's Tower. When they got to their room, John's dad said, I'm going to take a quick shower and then we can grab some dinner. Okay. John fingered the eye patch and waited until he heard the shower run. Then he slipped it on. The floor went from steady underfoot to a gentle rocking. Not the hard rock of a sea of shit of a ship at sea, John ran out from the small closet of the berth and saw the Dragon of Plunder was in port at Nassau. He ran up to his mom, who was climbing the rope back from town. You made it, John exclaimed. We did, his mom said, but there's been a complication. What kind of complication? John bounced anxiously from foot to foot. Anne's being held in Blackbeard's tower. There's no way to get access to her. John's mom put her hands on her hips. I can help, John grinned. Me and Dad are in the Sioux. In our time, I got this brochure. He showed it to Mom. Look, Blackbeard's Tower. I can go there in our time and find a way in. His mom smiled. That sounds like a perfect plan. John returned to the hotel room just as his dad walked out of the bathroom, wearing a change of clothes and drying his hair. Phew, close one. Ready to get some dinner? His dad asked. Yep, John said. And well, there's something else I'd like to do while we're here. He told his dad about the brochure in Blackbeard's Tower. It's a big deal for my essay, Dad. You and your essay. His dad took the brochure from John and skimmed its contents. We can probably find a restaurant around here. Initially, they set out for the bus stop, but John didn't want to wait for the bus. He wanted to get there and look around as soon as he could. Why don't we just walk, Dad? After all, he'd walked from downtown to Blackbeard's Fortress before. It was only a couple of miles. His dad agreed, and they took the East Bay Street to Eastern Road. It was difficult for John to believe this was the same city that they'd visited so many times in the past. Absolutely everything was different now. But as they got further from downtown, there were fewer tall buildings and more open spaces, shrubs, and dirt. Not as much as before, but enough that John could point out a thing or two to his dad. Those are called trees of life, and those are coconut palms over there. Soon, the top of Blackbeard's tower peeked through the trees. While in the past, the tower was in a clearing, now vegetation had reclaimed much of the ruins. John ran around, taking note of all the changes. Where the ramparts had once stood, where the wall was crumbling, and found a place on the western wall where John was able to squeeze through and go from outside the towers to inside. He had his way to rescue Anne.